Okay, the mill machine has a base, which I'm kicking right now. Coming up from the base, we have the column, ending right here. And on top of the column, we have a turret, which allows this whole top portion to swing around at different angles. Turn it right around backwards if you wanted to. You've got a ram on top of that. This ram can be slid forward and back. And on top of the ram, you have, at the end of the ram, you have the whole tool head here, which we'll go into more detail in, in a minute. And then coming out from the column, you have the knee. And I would think the knee is sort of sticking out from the column. And on top of the knee, well, the, knee the knee, by the way, you can see it goes up and down if you crank this handle. And on top of the knee, we have the saddle. And the saddle um, can go in and out for our cross feed. And on top of the saddle, we have our table, which can be turned to either of these two hand wheels here. And it goes back and forth for our, our longitudinal feed or our X axis. And each of these movements is moving on a dovetail. You can see the dovetail here. And it provides for a linear movement. And each one has a hand wheel with it. And along with the hand wheel is a micrometer crawler. And this micrometer crawler will show you in more detail in a second. But the micrometer crawler is marked off in thousandths of an inch. It turns with the hand wheel, but you can loosen the lock on the micrometer crawler, rotate it to zero, and then lock it, and then go a specific distance from that zero. Each of those hand wheels has a micrometer crawler on it and a hand wheel. And each movement also has a lock associated with it. So the table can be locked to the uh, saddle, and the saddle can be locked to the knee here, and the knee can be locked, as it already is, but it can be locked to the column right here. Okay, let's talk about the, about the tool head in more detail here. The tool head is comprised of a motor, and it was an on-off switch. Uh, the motor goes to a set of jibs, multi-diameter pulleys that come over here to a bunch of pulleys that also go on the spindle. You see as I turn the spindle here, uh, I turn the spindle here, see the drawing bar here is uh, turning with it. Um, that goes down through here, and we have a hand lever here, the quill hand feed lever, for feeding this part, which is called the quill, which doesn't rotate, but it goes up and down. And inside the quill, we have the spindle, which does rotate and goes up and down with the quill. Now you can see here the depth stop is doing its job of stopping the uh, quill at, the at whatever depth you set it at. Uh, this handle usually can be adjusted to different locations so I can move it to a more comfortable location. Uh, we also have a quill jack or quill lock here. If I put the quill down I can lock it there and it locks right in place. You always want to have that lock the next time you're doing any milling operations. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, the on switch. Here we have a speed chart for setting up your uh, RPMs on your milling machine. Uh, the chart has two rows. The top row is low gear or in back gear. It's also another way of saying it. And the bo uh, bottom row is for high gear. And the columns represent pulley positions. So if I was in high gear, if I wanted 11.15 for instance, I'd put it into high gear and I go on the next to the slowest pulley speed, which I'm going to show you next. Yep. Now, as I mentioned, we want to be able to go from high gear to low gear. And if you look at this lever here, it has an in and an out position. When you're in, you're in back gear, which as I mentioned is low gear. So if I move this over, I'm going to have to rotate the spindle a little bit at the same time. And this lever on the top also has to be in. These two levers work together. They're either both in together or both out apart. Right now that's in low gear. So I just set that in the low gear. I'm going to open up this guard and now you can see those uh, shifts for adjusting the speeds, the columns in that chart we talked about. In order to change this belt position here, we have to loosen this clamp on the motor, give the motor a little pull, that will release the tension on the belt. And if I wanted to go faster, I would drop the belt down so it would be a larger pulley on the motor. If you think about it as this large pulley goes around once, this pulley is going to go around multiple times, so that would be fast. Whereas the top pulley on the motor, if that goes around once, that's only going to go around part of the turn, so that would be the slower. So now you know which way to go with the chart. And if you just jump it down, if I can do this with one hand here, do the small end first, and then over on the big end, and then you need to push on the motor, and while you're pushing, just throw that lock, and close that guard back up. That's 
how you change the uh, pulley positions. Now to go back into high gear, I'm going to go to the out position of this knob. Remember, these knobs are either together or apart. And then back out here. And then you have to grab the spindle and give it a little rotation. You should hear it click. I'm going to rotate the spindle from below. And you hear that click. If you don't do that and you turn on the spindle, it's going to, the gears are going to grind. And it will uh, not be good for the machine at all. And it's kind of embarrassing too. So whenever you go from low to high, you always want to give it a little rotation until you hear that click. And now you should be in high gear. So let me show you an example. If we were cutting steel, say mild steel, with a one inch high speed steel cutter, uh, we would use the equation RPM is four times the cutting speed divided by the diameter. And for steel, we're going to use a cutting speed around 90 feet per minute. So four times 90 is 360, divided by a one inch cutter would be 360. So you go to your chart, which we showed you earlier, and on the chart, we want to find the closest thing to 360 without going over. And I see 325. 325 on this chart is in low gear, it's the top row, and it's the fastest speed in low gear. So I have to make sure I put this in low gear, and I take these two knobs, put the knob down here in low gear or in back gear, sometimes you have to turn the spindle a little bit by hand to get that to go in, and the top knob has to go in with it, or either in together or out apart. Uh, then I'm going to open up the guard, and I'm going to look, and that wants to be on the fastest speed on the pulley. So the fastest would be down at the bottom, I loosen the clamp for the motor. You always drop down on the small end first. And I kind of push in on that belt to make it engage with the pulley. Turn those pulleys. You never want to get your fingers in there where they get pinched. I'm always turning the pulley rather than the belt. Push on the motor and lock it. Re-engage. Now you probably can see that if I turn it on, you see the pulley's turn. Next I want to show you how to use the power uh, spindle feed, or quill feed also. And we have one lever here which we pull the knob out, we can switch it to three different positions. And sometimes... Here's a close up of the uh, quill feed uh, setting lever here. They're all multiples of one and a half. You have one and a, uh, one and a half thousandths per revolution, three thousandths per revolution, and six thousandths per revolution. And to change it you'll probably have to turn the spindle on. Then you can switch the feed rates by pulling out of that knob and selecting which feed you want. Those are in inches per revolution. That's how much the quill goes down for every revolution of the spindle. Uh, in order to engage the feed, uh, you also have to make sure that the worm is engaged over here. It says, you know, stop the machine before engaging the feed worm. That's out and that's in. Right now we're all set for using our power feed, it's engaged. If you're not going to be using your power feed, you should put it in the out position so it doesn't get the wear and tear in the worm all the time. So we'll engage it in the in position. I'm going to turn it on and I'm also going to show you this is the feed reverse knob right here. If you pull out, it makes the feed go one way. If you push in, it makes the feed go the other way. In between is neutral. So I'll turn it on. I'll show you the feed in action now. I'm going to turn on the spindle. See it's rotating clockwise. If I engage the power feed lever now, the uh, coil is going down and it disengages when it hits the depth stop. If I want to reverse the feed, all you need to do is pull out on that knob, engage the feed, now you see it's going to feed in the other direction. It puts off when it gets to the top. And in between here, you can get it in between, is neutral. down. If I wanted to, I could just go ahead and drill holes with this, and I could replace this with a collet and an end mill, something you might see in a wood router, something similar to that, and the part that's held in the vise or clamped to the table, and as the table is moved beneath, the uh, part is cut. The grooves can be formed, flat surfaces can be formed, you can bore holes, uh, there are all kinds of operations you can do. Okay, next I want to show you how to align the spindle axis to the table. And the best way to do that is to remove the vise. So to remove the vise, I'm going to loosen the two screws. Uh, they go into the T-nuts, go into the T-slots of the table. You can see the T-nuts. Go into these T-slots of the table on both sides. I've lowered the knee down so that the vise is nice and low, so that I can just slide it off without having to bend my back at all. 
and just swing it right over to the bench. If you need any help, don't try to be macho, just get someone to help you. Uh, but you definitely want to be able to slide this vise, staying straight the whole time, right over to the table, nice and safe. Okay, now we can see that the table is all exposed. We're going to clean that off with a brush and clean off anything else that's left with a rag. And our goal next is to make the spindle axis square to that table. And um, to, you, to do that, we're going to use an indicator set. Let's go. This is one of the indicator sets that you'll need to sign out. I would recommend at the beginning of every class, if you're going to be using a milling machine, you go and sign out one of these sets and you at least check the tram of your milling head. If your head is way out of alignment, you'll be making parts all, all uh, during the lab rather than bad parts, rather than good parts. So let me just show you how to set this up. Um, take this little indicator out. I've shown you indicators before, but you can see the indicator here. If I push in on the back, the needle goes around, indicating how much that's getting pushed in. And it's marked off in thousands of an inch. This is a back plunger type indicator. And somehow we need to get this so that it can swing around in the plane of the table. So we need a right angle attachment. And that's right in here. Put that right angle attachment, the small hole goes on the small rod, and the big rod goes in the bigger hole. Okay, and I'll show you this, we've all tightened up. Now we've got a shaft at a right angle to that indicator shank. And next we're going to put that inside of the collet of the machine. Very careful with that indicator at this point. That's a 5 16 collet. And the collets are an R8 style shank. Uh, you can see here that it's straight for a ways and it has a taper on it. <clears throat> and there's a keyway in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the keyway lines up with a key that's up inside of the spindle. And it's, the end of the collet is threaded. The end of any of these R8 shanks is threaded. Um, and like the 7 16 thread, and there's a drawing bar that goes down through that spindle. In fact, if I, I can pull it right out of the end and I can show you the end of the drawing bar, it will screw right into the end of that collet and draw it up into the spindle. I'm put that back in. And slide, line that keyway up, slide it up in, hold it there while you. So I'm holding up in on the collet while I turn it on the drawing bar. You never want to tighten a collet without something in it, because it'll spring the collet. I'm going to slide the shaft up in to the uh, collet. There we go. It was up in there a little too tight. And I'm turning on the top, tightening the drawing bar. And you can use your vice handle, just put it right on top, go ahead and tighten that drawing bar. And this brake will break the spindle, hold it still, so that when you tighten it, it draws it right up into the spindle. Now I can let up on the brake to re-grip, tighten, let up, pull, and then just take that right off. Always remember to take this off, never leave it on. If you leave it on, you might forget that it's there, turn the spindle on, and this will go flying, or at least take out the housing on the motor. So now we've got the uh, indicator mounted in the spindle. I'm going to go ahead and lower that spindle down. And now I need to raise the knee up to the indicator. Crank that up. Okay, so I've cranked the knee up. I'm going to continue to crank the knee up until it just, the table just contacts the indicator. It makes the needle start to move a little bit on the indicator. Uh, a good thing to note is that as this plunger is being pushed into the indicator, uh, the needle goes clockwise. Keep that in mind, it's going to make this a little bit easier. Now my goal here is to be able to touch on the front and the back of the table and side to side of the table. What we're trying to do is establish um, a plane and actually you only need three points to do that. You could do two points in the back and one point in the front. Some people do it that way. I think it's a little, little easier to use for three points to find a plane. Uh, but I'll, let me show you the method that I, I prefer. I'm going to make sure I'm touching the front of the table 
have no trouble touching on the sides and in the back. And I don't think it's going to quite line up there, so I'm just going to extend it a little bit. And I might have to move the table some too. So now I'm touching in the back, I bring it around, and I'm touching in the front. That looks pretty good. Let's check that again in the back. Yeah. And I can touch on the side and 180 degrees. Now if we're touching this table on the right side, we zero our indicator. We can rotate this bezel so that the zero on the dial lines right up with the needle. If I rotate 180 degrees and that also reads zero, then I know that the axis is square to the table in that plane. So if I repeat that from front to back, then I'll know that the axis is square in the other plane and the square all the way around. So we've established that the axis is square to that table. Um, I think it's best to go ahead and tram it from side to side first. Side to side is easier from front than it is from front to back, and that'll get us somewhere on the ballpark. So I would recommend you always zero the indicator on one side and always make your adjustments on the other. So as I raise this knee up slightly more once again, I'm going to bring it to zero. So I continue to raise up the knee until the table just touches the indicator. I'm just going to make that needle move a little bit. And you want to note that as the plunger gets pushed into the back of the indicator, the needle goes clockwise on the indicator. Now you can rotate the needle, I mean you can rotate the bezel, which is the, the outer edge and the whole face, the whole dial of the indicator until it reads zero. The thing you want to do when you train your head is make sure all your locks are locked. Because when you go to lock them, it will make things move a little bit. Okay, so I've locked them, it did move slightly, I'm going to read zero that. And our goal is to be able to touch it on this side, this side, and front and back all at the same time. I'm going to rotate this 180 degrees to the other side, going over those T-slots gently. I'm actually not even touching the table here, so I have to raise the knee a little more. I'll raise it until it just touches. I'm going to bring it back. I'm always going to zero it on the other side. I'm always going to adjust it on the opposite side. Now I have to help it over this just a little bit. It's so far out of whack now. Zero that indicator. Zero on that side. I'm going to rotate it 180 degrees to the other side. If I can get that to be zero on both sides, I know the axis is square in that direction. And the indicator went counterclockwise about 29 thousandths, which means the whole head is tilted this way a little bit. I know that because the indicator is going to be pressed more on this side than it is on this side. The whole thing is tilted that way. So I'm going to have to figure out how to rotate it in the other direction. To do that, you have to look at the four locks that lock the end of the tool head in place. It's four lock screws here. I'm going to loosen those four screws. And you want to just loosen them and then re-snug them a little bit. So they should be quite tight. I'm going to loosen them, re-snug them a little bit, just a little bit, because you don't want this thing flopping around. Loosen and just snug it. Loosen and just snug it up a little bit. As I'm looking at this, it's still right around 29 thousandths. It didn't move when I did that. On the side of the machine, you'll see this little hex head sticking up here. That goes to a little worm gear, which is engaged, a little worm which engages with a worm gear. When you turn that, it makes the whole tool head rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate this, and I want to rotate it so that the uh, needle on the indicator goes about halfway back towards zero. It's not going to be exactly halfway back. It's kind of got to do with the equation of the circle, but it's a good place to start, halfway back. So I just went back. Actually, that's just about, just about halfway right there. So uh, I will zero it here, but I'm going to re-zero it on the other side. Just in case I got lucky and got it right on the first try, I like to zero it on that side. And here I've got so now I'm off by about 12,000. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that back to zero. Again, I'm always going to zero it here, always going to adjust it over here. Things usually go faster that way so you don't get confused. So I'm going to zero on this side. I'm going to rotate it to the other side. And again, I'm about 12 or 13 thousandths off. And it's counterclockwise again. So I have to continue going the same way. Now because I'm doing it the same every time, I know that halfway didn't do it. So I'm going to go a little bit more than halfway this time. So that would be about maybe a little bit more. I'll try right there. I'm on about the 
negative three if you want to. Continue on over here. I'm closer, just don't want to quite there. If the pivot pin on the head is tight, you should be able to do this in just three or four tries. So there's zero on that side, rotate it to the other side, and I went a little too far, so now I'm clockwise about 8,000. So I know I gotta go back the other way, but I've, I've bracketed the right location. Somewhere in between there is the proper alignment of the head. I just take this back to about five. That is not terribly far off at all. Zero it on this side. Around here and check it on this side. And I am clockwise by about two thousandths. So I can continue to go the same way, just a little bit more. Alright, so I'm on about one on that side. And there I am. I'm about zero on both sides now if I zero that side. So I'm going to zero my indicator and go ahead and tighten these four. I got a couple of screws and a couple of nuts, but I'm going to tighten these four locks. I'm going to use a crisscross pattern, like if you're changing a tire. The whole time I'm looking at the indicator to make sure it doesn't move. It starts to move, I go to another head of a screw or bolt. Screw or nut, rather. The crisscross pattern. As it starts to tighten up, you're really going to torque it up. This isn't wood shop, you want to have things really tight. Doesn't move in the middle of your cut. And it's always good to double check and make sure that it reads zero on both sides at this point, which it does. Next, we're going to do front to back. Now, if you notice when we did side to side, here's a spindle axis coming up. The pivot point we're pivoting around with the head, runs right through the axis. However, when we're doing front to back, the pivot's in a little different location. You can see, in order for the head to pivot, it pivots on this pivot right here. There are three locks now instead of four, and there's our worm adjustment right there that causes the head to tilt forward and tilt back. It's important to understand that when this tilts forward, if the indicator is in the forward position here, <coughs> tilt this forward, the indicator is going to go down. The reading is going to go up on the indicator. Physically, it's going to go down. <coughs> As you can see, the pivot to the indicator is going to pivot like that. So as the head goes counterclockwise from your view, it's going to go down there. So some students are going to think, well, that means it's going to go up on the other side. Well, let's take a look at that. So we go from the pivot here to the indicator, it's not going to go up at all. In fact, as you tilt the head in that same direction, it's going to go down slightly. Of course, it's a shorter radius now, so it's not going to go down as much. So if you zero it on this side and adjust it on that side, zero it here, come over here if it's off by ten thousandths, go ahead and move it the full ten thousandths, maybe a little bit more, and you should be pretty close. If you understand that, it'll prevent you from going back and forth, back and forth, all through the whole lab. <clears throat> so, once again, let's go ahead and zero that indicator on the back. Zero the indicator, or turn the bezel. Rotate this around to the front. And I'm off by about five and a half, six thousandths of an inch. And the indicator went counterclockwise. That means I'm going to have to have the head tilt down, tilt this way, so that, that indicator gets, the back end gets pressed in more. If you forget, you can always just come and push on it. You can see which way it needs to go. So I'm going to loosen these three screws, lock them in place, pretty tight. Usually the vice wrench fits, whoops, hopefully it fits, let me jump to this one first. Just watch, in case it does slip, that you're not going to be driving your knuckles into something you don't want to. There we go. So notice I loosen it, and I just come back and snug it a little bit, because we don't want this whole head to just drop on us, just to keep the slop out of it here. Yeah, that feels about right, right there. And as I look, I haven't moved the head, it's still on about 6 thousandths counterclockwise from zero. So if you don't know which way it goes, just go ahead and put this on that screw and start to turn it. If it goes the wrong way, go the other way. I went a little 
little too much. Put that on zero. Bring this around. And wow, that's pretty close. So that's about one thousandths right there. I'm just going to go ahead and zero this side. Bring it around to the front. And I'm off a little bit still counterclockwise, but not by much. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that all the way to zero. And there I am on zero all the way around. When you go to tighten these, you want to make sure your indicator is on the other side. That way if the head starts to move, you'll notice it much quicker. It'll uh, happen much faster on this side than it does on the other side. So that reads zero right there. And tighten these three. Looking at the indicator while I do it to make sure it's, the head isn't moving on us. Creep up on it. Really lean on it pretty good. Cutter has a lot of leverage on these locks here, so it's good and tight. When I'm all done, I should be able to go all the way around and see that it reads zero all the way around. Now, for most of the stuff you're doing in here, if you're within one thousandths over this distance, you're probably going to be more than adequate. In reality, some of the stuff you're doing, probably three thousandths over that distance would be adequate. But that gives you some idea of what you're shooting for. If you come out here and you check your machine and you're within two or three thousandths, you may decide to just go ahead and start cutting. But if you're up by twenty thousandths, you definitely want to trim your head. So that is uh, trimming a head. <coughs> so the next thing we want to do is put the vise back on the table. And before we do that, we want to make sure the indicator is, is well out of the way. In fact, you may want to remove it just to make sure you don't bump it with the vise. I'm just going to take that out. And before we do anything else, we want to make sure, make sure this table is all cleaned off. I wiped it all off with a brush and a rag, and then I was taught to wipe it with your hand to get the dust from the rag off. So we get that all nice and clean. And then we're going to go over to the vise, and we're going to make sure that's clean, which I'll show you next. Okay, I've stood the vise up on end here. You want to make sure you spot it. It can't possibly fall off. Uh, Take all the chips out with a, a chip brush and then go ahead and take a rag, clean rag. And you want to clean the surfaces that are going to mate up with the table, but you also want to make sure any other surfaces are clean so that chips don't fall as you're mounting the vise. Now, we've, we just spent all that time aligning the vise to within a thousandth of an inch all the way around, while the chip here could easily be ten or fifteen thousandths. If that's on the table with a chip under it, you're going to find that it's going to throw your parts all off, you know, be getting parallel surfaces. So I get this all nice and clean, and then I'm going to mount it back the same way I took it off. I've lowered the, I'm going to lower the table down so that I can just slide it right on without having to lift it up. Okay, I've uh, slid my vise, my clean vise, back on my clean table. Uh, I've also cleaned up my T nuts and my T slots. You don't want any chips in these washers or anything, or even have uh, a spongy clamping situation. You want everything to be as rigid as possible. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. And I've done this on the other side as well. I'm going to snug these nuts up on both sides. In fact, I'm going to show you two different ways to trim a vise. Because sometimes a vise has this swivel base on the bottom, and sometimes it doesn't. And you need to know both ways to do it. I'll show you the, the way to do it if it has a swivel base. You can use either method if it has a swivel base. I'm going to get those nuts tight first. Then I'm going to need a wrench to loosen the other so these two nuts allow the vise to be swiveled. You can see the vise swivels, pivots right between those two block nuts there. And our goal now is to go ahead and trim the solid jaw of the vise. Hopefully after trimming the head and making everything clean, the bottom of the vise is nice and flat and parallel with the table. But now we have to make it so that the uh, solid jaw the vertical surface is parallel with the movement of the table. This movement right here. Got my vise on there, and eyeball it as close as I can, and I'm going to return that indicator into the uh, right angle attachment. Now you don't really have to use a right angle attachment for this, but it will save you some work. You can just go ahead and swing it down so it's vertical, and you're all ready to go. And you always want to indicate off the solid jaw, not the movable jaw. The movable jaw, you probably hear it. Well, that movable jaw is. Uh, it's got a little bit of play in it. That's intentional so that if you're clamping a piece that is not quite parallel, the jaw floats into place. What that means, the only jaw you can count on is the solid jaw. That's our reference surface right there. 
I'll just get this jaw open so you can see a little bit better. <coughs> and just like when we trim the head, we want to always zero on one side and always adjust on the other. It's not as important for this, it's a little simpler to keep track of. Let me violate that rule myself here when I'm showing you, but as you're starting out, it might not be a bad way to go. I'm going to go ahead and put that indicator right on zero. I zero the indicator, which means rotating the bezel over. And I'm going to rotate, I'm going to uh, move the table over, look at what, what the indicator is doing. The indicator, indicator is going clockwise now. The middle of the indicator is going clockwise, which means the plunger is being pushed into the indicator, which tells me that the whole vise has to rotate this way. Now, over the length of those jaws, I'm only off by about 26 thousandths. Not too bad for eyeballing. And I'm going to go ahead and take my dead blow hammer, dead blow hammer right here, and I'm just going to lightly tap this so that it goes away from the indicator. Now, because it's pivoting in the middle, I should be able to go about half the amount. So that's about 26. If I take that to about 13, if that pivot in the vise is nice and tight, we should just about have it. And I am going to snug those up a little bit more than that. I don't need to be that loose. Because it's apt to move if you go from real loose to real tight. I've got a piece of cardboard here to protect the table. And I mean, you could zero it here if you want when you go back. You can also use your power feed in this case if you want when you're trimming. Oops, it jumped a little bit. Again, you want to make sure all your locks are locked except for the table axis. And zero it. I'm off by about a, maybe a half a thousandths right now. And that's not too bad. We could, we could stop it right there and go ahead and tighten these nuts. Keep an eye on the indicator to make sure it doesn't move. Actually, it did move a little bit. Just loosen that. Tighten the other one a little more. Now it's staying put there. I'm not a big fan of adjusting the wrenches. It wants to be good and tight. And I'm going to put that right on zero and just double check. Sometimes the jaws are a little more worn in the middle than they are on the outside. So you see the indicator move a little bit and it'll come back to zero on the ends. And we are off a little bit. It went counterclockwise just a little. Might be a little bit without loosening things up. I think it just jumped off that. Let's try that. So zero there. That's a little better. A little last bit of tweaking there. Yep, that's good. That's within maybe about a quarter of a thousandths right there. So we've just trimmed the cell jaw of the vise, which means we've aligned the vise with the x axis. You can also trim it with the y axis just as easily. Uh, now I'll show you the second method for doing this. If you don't have the swivel base on here, uh, you'll be just using these two uh, nuts clamping it directly to the table. Now you're no longer pivoting in the center between those two clamps. So rather than just trying to do it and have it happen randomly, what you try to do is uh, have, in fact I can use a different wrench for this. If you don't have the swivel base, what you want to do is loosen both sides but make one side quite snug. Not like tight, but snug. Take the other side and loosen it and have that considerably looser than the first side. Just lightly snug. Now what you've done is you've controlled the situation, you've made it so that it's going to pivot on this screw rather than just randomly bumping around. Because it's pivoting on this screw, and even if it was this screw, if you didn't have the base, you're almost pivoting right at where the indicator is right now. So the right way to do this is to zero the indicator on the side of the jaw that's on the tight screw. Then, actually, let me throw it out of whack so you can see how to do it. Throw it out of whack in the middle. I'll zero it on that screw. <coughs> Come over to the other side. And I've moved about uh, eight thousandths. Now, you don't go back halfway on this. You go back the full amount on this, on 
this right here. So I've gone counterclockwise eight. I'm going to tap it pretty gently because I don't want to send shock waves into that indicator. I'm going towards the indicator. I like to go gently. Bring that right to zero. Back to the other side, which is close to zero. That pivot point's a little off to the end, so that's eh, pretty close, but maybe not even a quarter of a thousandth. So, a little bit more of a workout now. The right way to do this is to tighten this side, and then come to the other side and tighten this side. Because if it's going to move, you'll notice it on this side more. And tighten the other side. Looks like it's staying put pretty well. Nice and tight. And it's good to double check when you're all done. So that's trimming your vise two different ways. Using the two screws if you're pivoting in the middle, and using two screws if you clamp directly to the table with one of the screws tighter than the other. Okay, here's an edge finder. We're going to be using the edge finder to locate the spindle axis over the edge of your part. In fact, if we do two edges, then we've located the spindle axis over the corner of the part. And the edge finder is a hollow uh, piece of steel here that has, you know, sometimes it has two ends, sometimes it only has one end, and they're connected by a spring. See how they can move back and forth. This is the end they're going to be using today. Uh, this diameter, if you just kind of remember this for a minute, is 200 thousandths in diameter. I'll stick that in the grain for a second. We're going to put that in a collet. These are only used in a collet. We don't want to use them in a drill chuck. So this is a half inch shank. I'm going to go ahead and put it up in this half inch collet. And I'm going to put the collet in the <coughs> spindle, line the key up, create the drawing bar, and you got to take the uh, vice handle right there and tighten that drawing bar. And edge finders want to be run as close to a thousand RPM as you can get. So I'm going to just quickly set my RPM at 1115, which is high gear and the fastest. That's uh, excuse me, the next to the slowest. Clip, I'll just jump there right up to there. There we go. I'm going to turn on the spindle. Turn my spindle down. Uh, what I'm going to do today is locate the spindle axis over this corner. I'm touching with my finger right there. So, first I'm going to do the back edge. I bring this down, you don't want to touch the end of the uh, edge finder on anything. I want all my locks, except for the one that's going to be doing the actual moving. I'm going to move in until that edge finder starts to touch my part. Right about there, I'll probably loosen the lock on my parameter collar. And continue to go in, just clockwise on this hand wheel, until all the wobble comes out of that edge finder. Okay, all the wobble comes out, and then I'm going to really slow down, continuing to go in until it just kicks off to the side, just like that. Right there, I'm going to take my micrometer collar, it's 200 all the way around, I'm going to set it on 100, and I remember that I was going clockwise when this was zero. I'm also going to zero my Y axis on my, on my machine if I have it, but this one isn't working, which is why I'm showing it in two different ways. So I zero my Y axis at this point. So it's not a big deal if you don't have an edge front, uh, digital readout for this. The very important step now is to raise the spindle out of the way. If you don't raise the spindle out of the way now, you'll break that tip right off the next step. Raise the spindle out of the way. Now, as I mentioned, this is 200 thousandths in diameter. So right now, we are 100 thousandths away from the spindle axis, that edge is. It's okay for me to bump this and touch it. It's not a cutter. You see how I can take that wobble out? My fingernail. I'm going to continue to go in the same direction now so I can track that until this reads zero. Remember I said it on 100. I'm going to go until it reads zero. Right there. Now my spindle axis is right over this edge. It's a good idea just to double check, just to look. You should see half that diameter hanging over this side and half hanging over this side. Now if you couldn't get to this edge, you could have found that same edge by going off the surface of the jaw. The same edge is just the other side of the plane. So now I'm going to go over and repeat that process over here. I'm going to go over to the end that I want to be on. I'm going to come in, keep track of my turns here, but one turn. I'm going to bump that to get it wobbling. Loosen my micrometer collar on this side. Actually, I'll do it on this side so you can see it. And I'll 
Come from this side, stay out of the shot here. We're gonna lower that spindle down. And again, we're gonna bring that against the part. All the wall is gone, and really slow down. So don't overshoot. Go until it just kicks off to the side. It's right there. Again, I'll zero my micrometer collar. I'm going to put it on 100 actually. And I was going uh, counterclockwise in this case. And then I'll take a pencil and I'll write it right next to the hand wheel, which way I was going when I zeroed it. This time I can show you on the digital readout. I'm just going to zero my x axis. Remember, we're going to raise the spindle up now. Once we raise that spindle, I'm going to go to zero on my micrometer collar. I'm going to go all the way to zero. As you should be able to see on the uh, digital readout, hopefully it's pretty close to zero. Uh, 100 thousandths. Yep, 100 thousandths. So I went from 100 to zero on here, which is 100 thousandths, which is 100 thousandths here. Do not forget now to zero your digital readout. Or all your measurements will be off by 100 thousandths. So now when I take the wobble out of this, I can see that the edge finder is half on and half off that part. It looks good. In fact, in order to get back to the uh, zero on this edge now, because you don't have a digital readout, you've got to remember that you're always going to end up going clockwise with this hand wheel because of the backlash. If I just take and bring this to zero, I'm going counterclockwise because I'm going to I can, I can actually see that I'm not hanging over that edge. What you have to do is go past zero counterclockwise and bring it back to zero going the same direction you were going when you zeroed it, which in this case is clockwise. So now I've just positioned my spindle axis right over that corner. Um, the next thing we do is if I wanted to drill a hole that was uh, one inch over and a half inch down, I'd simply just move in at half an inch, which would be two hundred thousandths. 400 thousandths, 500 thousandths. And then I can use my digital readout for the other one, set an inch. So one more inch. And of course, you want to make sure all your axes are locked. And go ahead and drill your hole at that location. So that's using the edge finder. To locate your spindle axis over a particular location on your on your part. Here are some parts made on the milling machine. Okay, now I want to talk to you about a machining concept called FIF. FIF stands for face edge edge face, and it tells you the order of operations to take a part that isn't square, machine it such that when you're all done, adjacent edges are square and opposite faces are, are parallel. Uh, here we have the side view of a vise. We have a part here, and it's being held in, in the vise uh, against the solid jaw and against these parallels. Remember, for a vise, the solid jaw is our precision surface, and our, the bottom of our vise is a precision surface. The bottom of the vise is parallel to the table, and the solid jaw is square uh, to the surface of the table. So, to machine this part, first we want to identify the faces and the edges. The faces are usually the larger surfaces. So, we're going to take and hold the, the part so the larger surface is up and machine surface number one here that face. Then we're going to take that face that we just machined, put it against our solid jaw, our precision surface there, and, uh, and machine edge number two, the smaller surface, that edge number two, and now we've established that surface number two is at a right angle to face number one. And between each of these operations, by the way, we're going to be deburring our part, taking off the sharp edges, and cleaning all the chips out, make sure everything's clean and it's going to mate up with those surfaces. Then we're going to take and keep face number one against the solid jaw, right here, keep face number one against the solid jaw, rotate the part so that the two goes down on the parallels, and now the third edge that we're going to machine is up. We machine that third edge, and the third edge is square with the face one, and parallel with uh, uh, edge number two down here. Again, clean, deburr all, of, all the edges, and put this back in with face the first face we machined against the parallels, and machine the opposite face four now. Now four is parallel with one and square with edges two and three. That just leaves the ends of the part to machine. And the ends of the part are often saw cut, nothing at all square about them. So if you look at the ed end view of the vise here, you can see I've taken this part and stood it up on end, 
and I've shown hopefully an exaggerated view of the uh, saw cut edge, which isn't square. We put that in and just let that go against that edge, put that uh, right against the bottom of the vise. This top edge would not be square with the side next to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a square, put that square against the bottom of the vise and against the side of the part. Hold that against the, the part and tighten the vise at the same time. Now we know that this, the sides of the vise are at a right angle to the bottom uh, of the vise. Excuse me, the sides of the part are right on the bottom of the vise. We machine uh, that surface, five right there. Then all we need to do is deburr, clean everything, flip it around so now N5 is down on a parallel or down on the vise and machine N6. And uh, if you don't do that, if you start with a part that's a parallelogram but the sides aren't square, and you start machining, as you roll that part around machining each side, you'll end up with a part that's not square. It look just like it did before with cleaner faces. Uh, so that's the technique for FIF and in machining. Here I've got a part right off the saw, and before you start machining the part, you want to make sure you prepare the part by getting rid of all the all the dings and all the sharp edges called burrs off of the part, it's called deburring the part. So I'm going to take my flat surfaces that I'm going to be locating um, against the vise or the parallels. I'm just going to run my file right over those surfaces to make sure that I don't have any dings on there. If this thing gets damaged in transport from the uh, where it's been manufactured. Every time it gets bumped like that, not only does it go in, but it displaces the material too. So you see there's a little, two little shiny high spots there. You want to make sure you get off all those, all those things all the way around. Just to make sure it's flat. Once you've done that, then you can go ahead and deburr the part. To deburr the part, I like to attack, there's a burr along this edge. I like to attack it at three different angles. A shallow angle right here. Let's go one, about a 45. Two, and then a shallow angle of the adjacent surface, three. And what that does is it attacks that burr right at uh, where it meets the part, rather than filing down on the burr. So I'll just go all the way around. You can see it, you can do it pretty fast, and it's a lot better than scrapping your part by not having those burrs gone. What you don't want to do is Go at it like playing the fiddle, and when you're all done, it's going to have this sort of multifaceted thing that's going to look terrible. And certainly, with your finished part, you don't want to do that because you can even scrap the part that way. So, there's the part all deburred. Next, I'm going to show you uh, uh, putting the foot in the vise using our FIF concept. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and machine this part. I'm going to use the concept of FIF. I'm going to do this face. And then I put that against the solid jaw, do an edge, keep that face against the solid jaw, do the other edge, then put that first face down, do the last face, and then I'll show you how to machine the end square to the part. Uh, first I'm going to go ahead and make sure the inside of my vise, and I've wiped off all the chips with a brush and a rag, and I'm making sure it's nice and clean with my hands. I'm going to take my parallels. The parallels are those precision ground hardened steel bars that are made in pairs, both the same height and they're parallel. I'm going to put that in, and that holds our part up off the bottom of the vise. And have my first face up. I want to position my part somewhere near the center of the vise. <clears throat> when I tighten the vise, I want to push it down on that handle. And after all that trimming we did, uh, we don't want to be pulling it sideways and possibly messing up our tr tram of our vise. So I'm going to push down on the vise, and then I'm going to take my dead blown hammer and just go ahead and give that a couple of whacks. Probably a few. You can see one of those parallels tightened and the other one didn't. That's because this bottom edge is not square to this edge. That's okay, it's nothing to worry about. I mean, you can try it again. And when I hit that, I want to hit it hard the first time, a little less hard the next time, a little less hard the next time. That way, that when the force overcomes friction uh, enough, it'll push the part down, but not so much that it bounces back up. Okay, I'm going to put this face mill in. There I have a face mill with the carbide inserts in it. It's got three indexable carbide inserts. When one of these corners becomes damaged or dull, you can index all three of these and you have uh, new cutting edges exposed. So you can get four cutting edges out of one of these inserts. These inserts are kind of expensive. They're about $15 a piece. So this has an R8 shank on it. It's got a keyway. I reach up in, find the key, put this into my spindle, slide it up in, hold it there. 
tighten the drawing bar by hand on top. And then I'm going to go ahead and tighten the drawing bar with a vice handle using the brake to break it. Tighten, re grip, tighten. Never leave the vice handle there. Don't even take your hand off it. Take that right out. It's really best to not have your vice handle on the vice while you're machining because the vice handle can run into your, your uh, hand wheels here or can run into the table and cause the vice to jam and to push sideways. So it's best to take it off. Uh, I've set one RPM up for this, four times the cut speed, four times um, 300 for aluminum, uh, divided by a two inch diameter here, and it comes up to about 1800 RPM, put it on 1750. I'm going to go ahead and lower this down and bring it against my depth stock. I like to bring my uh, depth stock to bear here and lock the quill, that way if the lock should fail, this can't possibly move its way down in, in the middle of your cut. <laughs> See that saw cut edge there? I think I can do this all in one pass. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to raise my knee up. I'm going to just touch that part. Yeah, about there's good for now. Just by hand, I'm going to send it past. And we'll call that our zero height. It gets a little bit higher on this side. And I'm going to take off maybe 20 thousandths for now. So if I zero my micrometer collar right here, I can crank up my knee about 20 thousandths, lock it. But to make my cut, I want to make sure all my locks are locked except for the axis to go in the movie. So I've got my cross speed lock over here, I've got my quill lock here, and my knee lock here. And this time I'm going to use the power feed. And uh, the power feed is a little different on each machine, but this power feed operates by... Right, let me turn this off for a second. This power feed operates uh, with this lever. If you push it to the left, the table goes to the left. The middle is off. Push it to the right, it goes to the right. It's a little dry. And you can see we can change that speed with this knob just by increasing it, slowing it down. And then we have a rapid traverse button. If you push that button, it just goes as fast as it can go. Just use for positioning, not for cutting. So I'm going to position this at the beginning of my cut. Turn my machine back on. And slow my feed way down to the edge it. And crank up my power feed. We'll face that first. Give us a pretty good finish right now. So here we have the part that's been faced. We have that first flat face that we can count on. Uh, we'll go ahead and take that part out of the vise now. No, so I'm pushing straight down, not sideways, to loosen the vise. And here we have the part that's been faced. Get fingerprints on it now. And we have burrs on the edges that we want to take off before we go to the next step. So I'm going to grab my file, use that same process. Now all my burrs are rolling off this way, so I can get to the base of the burr better if I start at this surface. So I'm just going to go one, you might see that burr fall off. Two and three. You can see the burr is almost falling off here. Almost ready to go. I'm just going to repeat that process. One, two, and there it goes. There's the burr right there. Just fell. And three. Oop, there's some of it over here still. I'm going to give three one more try there. There, I expect that. I see there's no burr. It's nice and smooth. I repeat that process over here a little bit faster this time. So some of the burrs fall off when I did that. Maybe one more time. If you hear it make that high pitch noise, you've got to slow down a little bit because you're chattering. Maybe change your angle of attack a little. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Maybe a little bit more. There is another technique you can use, especially with aluminum and softer metals. You can go along with the edge and as you're pushing, just roll it a little bit. 
You can see that it produces a nice edge too. So you got two options there. So we deburred those uh, edges that we just uh, machined. Next step is to clean this thoroughly, clean the vise and parallels thoroughly. So I'm going to get all the chips out of there. In fact, I'm going to move away from that cutter a little bit. Just make sure we don't bump it by mistake. With our hand. And all the chips are cleaned off of the parallels. Use my rag to wipe things a little bit cleaner. My hand to wipe that clean. Wipe the parallels. If you don't do that step, then a little chip can be underneath your part, and then you're not going to have the squareness that you're looking for. So there's the surface we just machined. That's our face. So we're going to put our face against the solid jaw. There's another technique for putting your parting with a hammer. If you tap it as you tighten the vise, that works pretty well too. I usually give it a few more hits afterwards too. Uh, now I'd expect both of those parallels to probably be tight. against the solid jaw. You could machine this either way. I like to keep my cutting forces going against the solid jaw, um, which is kind of a nice reason for having a depth stop here. I can raise this out of the way. Back to the beginning. And as I bring this down, I can see I'm a little too deep for this edge. So I'm going to just lower my knee a little bit. Turn it on. Raise the knee up. This one I'm going to throw up and keep track of how far I'm going. Raise my knee up a little bit. In fact, let me show you. Sometimes you just want to rough the surface. You don't want to spend a lot of time making a finished cut. So we're just going to go ahead and rough off some material here. Compared to the other surface, you can see it's not as smooth, a little rougher. So it's going to take a finish cut. I might just take maybe 10 thousandths of an inch for a finish cut. A little feedback this way, it's not that much of a load on the pool of the job. I'll we'll take a finish cut on that edge. The slower your feed, the better your finish. And the feed rate is the number of teeth on the cutter times the chip load per tooth for each tooth times the RPM. That's what you should set your feed rate at. Some of these power feeds are calibrated in each per minute. Okay. So now I've done another edge. I'm going to just repeat that process a few more times. Take the part out, take my file, see we've got a pretty good burr going there. You can hear it catching. And then one, two, three. There's much of the burr right there. Repeat that. That looks pretty good. Actually, there's just a tiny bit left. We'll use that other technique I showed you. Now you're apt to have more burrs on one side than another because of the way the cutter is pushing the material to rotate. In fact, you can plan on not having as many burrs if you have the cutter rotating uh, as it hits the part, it rotates in, in towards the center of the part. Kind of help to remove, lessen the amount of deburring you need to do. That looks pretty good right there. So, next. Once again, I'm going to clean everything, everything out. It only takes a minute, maybe, and it saves from scrapping apart. So it's well worth doing. Okay, now I've got my larger face here done. 
and I just did my edge, number two right there. So what I want to do is keep my face, my first face against that solid jaw, rotate so that my edge number one goes, number two rather goes down. Now these are square with each other and I've got this uh, edge number three facing up, or the machine. Parallel should definitely go tight this time. should be right at zero height right now. Just going to go ahead and machine a little bit off. Let's get this out of your way. 
Again, we deburr. You can see if we, we file like this, you probably can tell in the light that it doesn't look very good. And in fact, sometimes that means the part's been scrapped in industry. Deburring, deburring is actually an important step. As an engineer, you try to design manufacturing processes so there, there is as little deburring as possible. And there we have. Uh, face, edge, edge, face. What we have left to do now is machine the ends uh, square. And the ends right now are saw cut. There's nothing square about them at all. So once again, we're going to take this and clean out all of our chips. Now I'm going to replace those parallels. I think that's a smaller set of parallels. You want to try to have a substantial amount of surface in contact with your reference surfaces. So, as I have my part go against the solid jaw, I want to have quite a bit of it in contact with the solid jaw. I wouldn't want to have it way up on the edge like that. Deeper down in, the more apt I am to get that flat against that surface. So, now, yeah. descending on those parallels. Standing up too much, you want to consider having it hang over the end here like this and do it with an end mill, which I'll also show you. But for this, I think we'll be all right. Standing up. If I just tighten that right there, that's going to not be square. There's nothing square about that saw cut. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and take a square, machine square or a solid square here. I'm going to put that square against the parallel. Make sure my jaws are a little bit loose on my vise. And I'm going to do this so you can still see it. Hold that square up against the part. You can see the part is going to move right up against the square. While it's being held in place, I'm going to go ahead and tighten the vise. There's your blooper. Go ahead and tighten the vise while it's being held in place. There. Now this time, you don't want to hammer it down with a hammer. So you hammer it down with a hammer, it's going to go against the parallels and it's no longer going to be square. So we're just going to go ahead and clamp it right there, machine that in. Now, as you're going along machining this part, you can use that same square to check to make sure your part is in fact square. If you put your square, uh, solid part of your square up against the part, slide it down, hold it up against the light. If you can see any light coming through that, um, underneath that edge there, you know that you're not square. So you can go around, you can check all those edges and make sure that they're in fact square. And if you do that as you go, and if you make any mistakes, you'll catch them right off the bat. <coughs> Last thing to do is to do that sixth surface, the end. Make sure everything is clean here. Make it out. 
This time we can go right against the parallels and hammer it down. That way the, the end that is squared in this machine will also be uh, parallel with this last end. Both parallels should be tight all the time now. Machine the part, measure it so you know where you are. If you had another 20 thousandths to take off, you zero your micrometer curler here, raise it up 20, make that last cut. Take it out, you burn it, and you machine all six surfaces of your part using feet. All right, we have the part of the vise that we just uh, machined, and uh, after locating the edge using the edge finder, we've located this, this spindle axis over this corner. We call that zero, 00 on our XY axis. And now I'm going to show you how to drill a hole to depth and through the part. So the first thing we're going to do is use our drill chuck, which is also on an R8 shank. I'm going to put that up inside the spindle, find the key, slide it up in. Just like I've shown you before, tighten the drum bar by hand and then with a wrench. And we're going to put our center drill. Remember the center drill from the lathe, perhaps, but the center drill is a rigid drill. Uh, if you just try to drill a hole with a regular drill, it's very apt to wander a little bit, not go exactly where you want it. Uh, it has a chisel point on it, which makes it not want to start quite right. The center drill will make a nice starting hole the right accurate location, which will allow for the drill to follow that same path. So I'm going to put the center drill in and tighten it up using the chuck key. When you tighten it up, you never want to leave the chuck key in there. Always take it out. It would be very dangerous if you turn that on. I've calculated my RPM for this drill. I've set it already. And I'm going to position it where I want my hole. And I want my hole one inch over in the X. So on my digital readout, I'm going to go over one inch. And on this machine, the digital readout on the Y isn't working. So I'm going to move, uh, I'm going to go three quarters of an inch on the Y. And I'm using my dip my uh, my chronometer collar for that. So one turn is two hundred thousandths, two turns is four hundred, six hundred, and another half a turn is seven hundred fifty. I'll walk all my axes with my knee. And go ahead and center drill that part. Now when you're center drilling, uh, typically you only center drill to a depth that leaves you somewhere on that tapered portion of the drill. Somewhere on that tapered portion, you don't want to drill deeper than that, you want to drill less than that. Um, but you want to try to make sure that you're not drilling a hole larger than the drill you're going to be drilling it with. So you, you leave a uh, depression there where it's not supposed to be. Now go ahead and turn that on. And center drill it. And you see as I center drill it, I'm using pecking motion. I would recommend you use oil for this. I'll leave it out for the demonstration right now just so you can see it at first. That pecking motion allows us to clear the chips. If those, and it keeps the chips shorter too. If those chips don't clear, they'll plug up these grooves called flutes here, and then they'll rub on the inside of the hole, heat up and expand, and it can seize up, and your center drill can break off inside your car. Go ahead and take the center drill out, replace that with the drill I'm going to use. Pretty sure I'm going to have to lower the table down for this. So I'm going to put a half inch drill in. So here's a drill bit, half inch. You can see that it has the flutes, the grooves that allow for the drill geometry as well as help to remove the chips. And here's the end of it, here's the two cutting edges. Between those two cutting edges at the center there is that chisel point I was talking about. You can see it's a flat edge, it doesn't come right to a point. A little bit more. Just 
snug it by hand and then go ahead and tighten it with the chuck key. And I'm going to calculate my RPM for that. Four times the cutting speed of 300 is 1200. Divided by a half is 2400. So uh, 2400, uh, that will be pretty close to what I had it set up. I'm going to go ahead and leave it right there. And next, I'm going to show you how to drill to a specific depth. Now, holes, the depth of a hole is uh, generally from the full diameter of the hole. So zero wouldn't be at the tip here. It would be when it first gets to the full diameter. So the tape portion has to go all the way in. The depth starts from that point. So I'm going to listen on my chronometer caller and my crank first before I get to that point. Turn my machine on. My guess is that our pin might chatter a little bit. We'll give it a try. I'm going to go ahead and crank this knee up. And I'm going to just crank it. Oh, I want to use my depth stop. Sorry about that. I really had that all set. There we go. Turn that nut. Lock it. Turn it on. Raise my knee up. side, get right level, and you can see that I'm, I can unlock this and I can kind of peck my way down as I raise the knee up. I want to go right until I get just the corner of that drill. Just the corner of that drill. Touching right on this surface. So I'm at the full diameter right there. So with that diameter, I'm going to go ahead and zero on my chronometer call. I'm going to grab some oil for this, but now if I wanted to go ahead and drill that to a uh, half an inch deep, I just raise up my table a half an inch from here. So that would be five turns. One, two, three, four, five, right to zero. Lock it. Grab some oil. So I've got some oil there, and I just put a little oil in that indent. Works out kind of nice that way. All we need to do now is use a packing motion to drill this hole until we hit our depth stop. And you can see that once we get into the hole, the chatter stops. Then we have gallons of oil, a little bit of oil will make a good difference in drilling. See right now the depth stop is hitting. This depth stop hits right there. I've reached my depth. Raise it up. And you can also see that those chips, if I didn't keep pecking, those chips would just keep getting longer and longer. That's another reason for pecking. Remember, you don't want to handle any of these chips. Just go ahead and use your brush to sweep them away. The razor sharp, it can be hot, full of uh, kinds of nasty germs and things. So we've just drilled that hole to a half of an inch deep. Now if you're careful when you set your zero there, you can get that within probably five thousandths. Uh, usually hole depths with a drill aren't real accurate, or don't have real tight tolerances anyway. But uh, that's drilling in to a specific, specified depth. We can go ahead and drill the rest of the way through that part, and the only really difference there is when you start to break through the part, you want to ease up on the pressure a little bit because it's going to want to grab as it breaks through. I'll go ahead and show you that. To do that, we're going to have to lower our depth stop out of the way. I'll show you what happens if you don't use a pecking motion. The chips get pretty long and stringy. Pecking motion is certainly going to help that. The inside finish to your hole will be better too, the surface, if you use a pecking motion. Because once those chips plug up, they go around and kind of gall and score the surface, so you adhere to the surface. Now, as they're breaking through, I'm easing up on the pressure, and I'm through the hole. See, those chips got pretty long when I stopped using the pecking motion. The other very important thing here, and you can see it hasn't always, a rule that hasn't always been followed, is to make sure you know what you're drilling into before you drill it. 
Uh, you see in this vise, when you go to use it, there have been a number of holes drilled into the vise. Some of our parallels, you see that uh, people don't realize that the parallel is going to be in the way when they drill. Just do a little bit of math, very simple addition and subtraction, you can avoid any of those kind of mistakes. Uh, so that's drilling a hole. Let me show you how to countersink a hole next. Countersink it, I'll take the drill right out. I'll replace that with countersink. This is called a countersink. It's used to make a countersink, and the operation is called countersinking. So I guess machinists maybe aren't that creative when it comes to coming up with words, but uh, certainly a simple to remember. And to countersink, you want to run your RPM considerably slower than you would think. That's a, uh, it's a form tool. You have a lot of surface area contacts, so you're going to slow your RPM down. And so I'm going to run this down. In fact, if I just throw it in the low gear, it'll probably be what I need to do. I'm going to be changing the belts. So in the low gear means I have to turn my switch the other way to go the right direction. That looks good. Alright, now. The countersink, one operation, one reason for doing a countersinking operation is to deburr a prior. So that drilled hole has a burr on it, just like uh, we had burrs on the edges of the part after we milled it. Uh, by using a countersink, we can remove that burr pretty quickly. Let me just lower my spindle down, lock it, raise my knee up slowly until I see that burr come off. I raise it up, I can kind of inspect it. That looks good. Let's just deburr that part. If we had a hole pattern with 10 different holes in it, if you just go to those coordinates and deburr all those holes, they all look just the same. They all have the same amount as we use in the depth spot. Now, if you wanted a countersink for a, a, a flathead screw, which is another reason to use a countersink, uh, and you just continue going with your depth, you can do the math on this. You can trick it out so you know just how much to raise it from zero. The other way to do it is to just go ahead and keep raising it, have a screw right on hand, flathead screw. Just keep checking that screw. When the screw drops below the surface of the part, you're pretty much there. And again, if you have a whole pattern of holes, you can repeat it at that depth. And we've got a kind of sunk hole there. Another operation you can do with a kind of sink, probably shouldn't put this on film. Some shop teachers don't think you should do this. Uh, but if you have a bunch of holes and you need to deburr them, I've never had any trouble. Just barely went through there. Poke that out. There it is. You've got a burr on the back side. They might have 20 holes going through this part. Uh, and you could set it up, locate your edge again, and then go into the countersink. Another way to do that is just go ahead and turn it on. Then go the right way. Bring it up. Just touch it. You just deburred that part. As long as you don't have any keyways in there or holes that are inside of slots or whatever, never had any trouble doing that. So that's using a countersink and uh, drilling a hole in a location um, that you uh, figured out using your edge finder to bury the part. Okay, here's a, an end mill. And this is a double ended end mill. And it's a two fluted end mill. You see it's got one groove here and another groove over here leaving two cutting teeth. Um, an end mill is another thing you're going to be using quite a little bit on a, on a milling machine. Uh, these end mills always want to go in collets. They don't want, never want to go in a drill chuck. I'm just going to go ahead and put a half inch collet right up inside the spindle. Take it a little by hand, not completely. Put my end mill up inside. And I'm going to spot that cutter so it can't possibly fall out while I tighten this a little bit by hand and use my lock to finish tightening it. If I calculate my RPM for that, it's going to be around 1800. There, I've got my speed all set for that. The belt position is already right. I'm going to lower this down a little bit. You do want to be careful when taking really heavy cuts, not to have it sticking down any more than you need to for rigidity's sake. That's going to be fine for what we're doing today. And let me show you how to use the end mill to machine the end of a part. Uh, probably not going to have that end mill be big enough to the entire end of that part. 
But when I showed you fifing and machining the end of a part using a face mill, I showed you how to machine that end standing the part up on end. Well, this is another way to machine the end of the part. Uh, if you have a skinny part, this is a good way to do it. Or a part that's too long to stand up on, on end, it's also a good way to do it. There are some issues associated with it. Uh, you will get deflection with the cutter. So when you machine the end of the part, it's less apt to be square on the end if you do it this way. I'm not going to be able to go the whole length of that part. But come along here. I can see, I can at least machine the end and make a little step on the end of the part for you. Whenever you do machine the end of the part, you want to make sure the parallels aren't sticking out so that you can end up machining the parallels by mistake. When you cut a part, uh, you have to be aware of two ways of cutting the part. It's called climb milling and conventional milling. Here's a cutter right here. This is another end mill. And this one probably has, I think, six boots on it. This cutter has to rotate in this direction. Tool geometry dictates that. That's the way it has to rotate in order to cut. No choice there. However, when you cut your part using the side or the periphery of the cutter, you have two options. You can feed against the rotation of the cutter, like that, or you can feed with the rotation of the cutter, like that. The former is called conventional milling, and the latter is called climb milling. This is called climb milling right here. So if the cutter is climbing up along the side of the part, that's called climb milling. You don't want to do climb milling on conventional machines. In other words, machines that aren't controlled by CNC with uh, lead screws, ball lead screws, uh, because of the backlash. If you think about it, the screw, as you turn these handles, is a screw pushing the table. It's going through a nut. And there's slop in that nut called backlash. And as it's pushing against the part, the screw is pushing against the part, all of a sudden the cutter is pulling against the part. It pulls that slop out all of a sudden. And that can be more than the tooth can handle. The tooth will break off. Then the next tooth will hit the broken tooth. And then all the way around, all the teeth get broken off. So we don't want to climb mill on these machines that aren't designed for it. We always want to be feeding against the rotation of the cutter. Okay, with that in mind, let's look at our setup here. <clears throat> this cutter has to go clockwise from the top, as we're looking at it. It has to go in that direction. So in order for me to go against the rotation of the cutter, I'm going to have to feed my part in this direction. Uh, that would be against the rotation of the cutter. This would be feeding the surface of the part with the rotation of the cutter. We don't want to do that. Other than the, for the very shortest distances and the very lightest of cuts, we can get away with it. But normally we don't want to do it at all. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on, bring my part against the cutter until it just touches. I zero my readout. In fact, I can come away from my part now if I want to, so I zero my readout. Come over, I don't know, say I wanted to take uh, 100 thousandths off of that part. So I can take. Let's make it 125. So we're in that vicinity. Go ahead and walk my walk. And I'm going to go ahead and feed against the rotation. Okay, you want to make sure all your walks are walked except for the one that's doing the movement. Which in this case is my Y axis, which is my saddle on my knee. this because it's a pretty shallow cut, but uh, and, you know, on the side. The general rule of thumb for animals is you don't want to cut more than half the diameter at a time. So for half a ten, you only go about a quarter of an inch deep. I'll put it deeper than that. I'm going to show you what, how much deflection we have. If I just feed this back, I'm not going to move anything. I walk on the y-axis a little bit. See how it's taking a little bit of a cut? Also going to end up with a better finish probably. That cutter is going to deflect away. Once it's thing is a rigid body, so it will deflect a little bit. Um, so that's machining on the end. Let me show you. Let's see. Let me show you how to machine a slot. Using your edge finder, you locate your, uh, your zero zero. You can go ahead and machine a slot. Let's not go down. Well, let's, let's set the depth too. Come over here, where we want our slot. Loosen my micrometer collar on my knee. Raise my knee up till I just touch the part. 
There's another technique you can use for this, and that's using a piece of paper. You can use a piece of paper here as a feeling gauge. This paper is 4 thousandths of an inch thick. I can get in there now. Once you hit the paper, you know you're about 3 or 4 thousandths away. So right about there, we're about 3 or 4 thousandths away. Or you just can keep going until you just touch the fire. If you're allowed to touch the part. So there's the top of my part. I'm going to call that zero. Zero on my chronometer collar on the knee. And I wanted to make a slot that was 100 thousandths deep. And I just raise my knee 100 thousandths, relock it. In this case, I'm going to use my power feed. Whenever I can, I'm going to use my power feed. Because this only has two teeth as opposed to four teeth or three teeth, six teeth, whatever, I can't feed it as fast. The more teeth you have, the faster you can feed it. The advantage of fewer teeth is your flutes, your glutes, your grooves are bigger. This gives you more chip clearance, which actually is desirable for softer materials like aluminum. So I machine to slot there. Of course, in addition to slots, we could just as easily machine a uh, pocket. So I have this all calculated out. Where I want to put my pocket. Get my cuts. Notice I'm conventional cutting as I machine this pocket rather than climb cutting. And I just machine a little pocket there. If I was going to mill my part to length this way, I would clean off one end with the end mill, deburr it, clean everything, turn it around, make a light cut until the saw cut cleaned off on this end, deburr it, and then measure it. Don't move anything, just leave everything right where it is, measure it, and if I have 20 thousandths to go, I just go ahead and move my table 20 thousandths, make my final cut, and my cart goes right out the sides. Quality's not an accident, it, uh, you shouldn't be guessing with these things and creeping up on it. We can make it come out right the first time. All right, uh, next I want to show you how to tap a hole. I'm really showing you how to center drill and drill. I center drilled and drilled my tap drill hole here. Remember, we're going to do a quarter 20 tap here. And if you want to tap a hole for, for a quarter 20, you do not want to drill it a quarter of an inch. Otherwise, you're removing all the material that's going to have the threads in it later on. In fact, the formula for a tap drill size is D minus P, the diameter, the nominal diameter, minus the pitch. So it'll be for a quarter 20, uh, the pitch is 1 over 20, or 1 20th. So D minus P, it comes out to be a number 7 drill, uh, which is 201 thousandths, the closest thing to it. So we're going to go ahead and turn it on. We're going to countersink that hole to the diameter, to the nominal diameter. So I'm going to countersink it to a quarter of an inch. You countersink it before you tap it, you really don't have any deburring to do after this. Makes that tap start a little bit better. And if I had a bunch of holes to do, I would probably drill them all first and then kind of sink them all next and, and then go ahead and tap them. As long as you're using a digital readout and get back to that same location, you should be all right. Uh, so I'm going to be using a tap. There's a quarter 20 tap. And you see the flukes there, the grooves in the tap to provide for chip clearance and the cutting edges. And I'm going to put that tap in a small tap wrench fit in this one. Yep, so go ahead and tighten it. It's just like a drill chuck, a little drill chuck. T-handled wrench here. Now the next thing is I want to go ahead and use, make use of this hole in the back of the T-wrench. That hole will help me keep my tap aligned to the hole that I've drilled here. It's a little center drill hole. And I'm going to do that by using this little guide center. This is just one I've made, but anything with a 60 degree point on the end of it, you can throw it right up inside your drill chuck. <coughs> Uh, so this is the uh, guide center that you're going to be using. Uh, you notice it's got a 60 degree point on one end and it's going to center drill a hole on the other end. For very small taps, you can put it in backwards and the small taps have a taper on the back of the, of the tap and you can use that to guide the tap. Or you can turn it around for taps that have a hole that's drilled in them or the hole that's in the back of the tap wrench. So I'll go ahead and put this, I call it a guide center in here. So 
lock that up. I'm going to have to lower my knee down so that I can reach. I'm going to be tapping that hole. I haven't moved my table on the X and Y axis at all since I've drilled it. And this is very important. Now, one way to prevent having broken taps is to tap them straight. If you start going at an angle, the deeper and deeper you go, the more that tap is going to want to bind. So going in straight is important for not breaking the tap. You also always want to drill deeper than your tap. Your tap doesn't go all the way through your par. I usually tell students that when they're designing to, to tap at least uh, five to seven threads deeper than the, the tapped threads have to be. So if you want an inch of threads in this hole, it should be a lot for a quarter twenty. But if you want an inch of threads there, you want to go ahead and make sure you've drilled about five twentieths of an inch past that, quarter of an inch past that. Okay, so I'm going to put my tap in the hole. That's assuming the park allows for it. You're not drilling into a pressure vessel or something. Alright, now what I'm doing is I'm hanging on to this uh, handle, hand feed handle here. I'm just going to apply a little bit of pressure down and turn my tap clockwise while the guide center guides it. I'm only going to go in maybe uh, a turn or a turn and a half at first, and then I'm going to back up just a little bit with my guide center and turn the tap backwards. Well, right now we're creating those chips, just like when we drilled the hole, those chips get longer and longer. By backing up the tap, we're breaking those chips off. And that will prevent it from binding later on. Binding and possibly breaking the tap. And in a reverse direction, which means I'm going to apply pressure on the handle. They're all also power tapping techniques. I'm going to show you that probably the best thing for what you're doing is going to be to hand tap these holes. And go ahead and maybe a half a turn to a turn clockwise and then back it up and you'll feel that chip break. You see how it gets tight now? Now see how it goes all of a sudden, I just broke that chip. And keep going in. Tap in the hole. The smaller the tap, the less of a turn you're going to be able to go clockwise each time. In fact, if you're, if you're doing a 440 tap, you might be going maybe a sixth of a turn and then backing up. Another sixth of a turn and backing up. You don't want to go too far. A quarter, 20 tap. I'm kind of using my hand as a torque wrench here. If it goes too hard, I definitely want to back it up and break that chip. So you just continue doing this until you get the depth that you want and really the best way to check your depth is to take a socket head cap screw. Take this out. Back it right out of there. You see how the chips have filled the flutes. If you've got a really deep hole, you might have to back it out, clear the flutes, and then go back in again. Just make sure if you do that, that you match up the threads. Just go nice and lightly until those threads match up. You don't want to cross the threads. If you're turning it hard at first, you're probably cutting threads between the ones you just cut. So that turns in nice and easy. If I had to go deeper. But uh, the best way to check that is to take a socket head cap screw. If I had a one inch socket head cap screw, if I screwed it in and it went all the way, I'd be all set. If it had to be a half inch of threads, I'd take that one inch socket head cap screw, screw it in until it stopped, and then I'd measure the gap underneath the head and then I know exactly what the depth of threads are. Because the depth is for the full thread, that's what you're looking for on a tapped hole. So uh, that's at least one method for tapping a hole on a milling machine.